Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I am Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. If you've been following us on Instagram, you've been seeing these posts that we've been doing every single day called Did You Knows? Every day for the next 31 days for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we are posting Did You Know? fun facts about breast cancer. So if you're not following us, hop on over to Instagram and check us out at survivingbreastcancer.org, all one word, and get in on the information, facts, knowledge, share, like, comment, and ask questions and join our thriving community. I also have to give a shout out to Madam Glam. We partnered with them because they care about clean beauty. Now, if you're like me and you're dying to get a pedicure or a manicure and you're not leaving your house because of COVID, you definitely need to find some products that can make your nails shine and also know that you're putting on good quality products that are not going to harm your skin, your nails, or your body. Madam Glam's products are gluten-free, vegan, cruelty-free, and nine-free. Now, if you haven't heard about what Nine Free is, they're actually one of the few gel companies for nail polish that have removed nine toxic chemicals from their products. These chemicals include formaldehyde, toluene, DBP, formaldehyde resin, camphor, xylene, ethanol to sal- ugh, I can't even pronounce this word, ethyl to solamide, parabens, and acetone. When you purchase products from Madame Glam, specifically in their pink collection this October, they will be donating $1 back to survivingbreastcancer.org. So if you're looking for some nail polish this season, check them out. I'll link to them in the show notes below and know that when you're purchasing their pink collection products, they're donating back to our nonprofit. In today's episode, we have such a treat for you because we have on the show today an amazing woman, Fitz Kohler. She is one of the most prominent and accomplished fitness experts and race announcers in America. She is the voice of the Los Angeles Marathon, Philadelphia Marathon, Big Sur Marathon, and the DC Wonder Woman's Run Series. She brings such great energy, high volume, and tons of inspiration. She is a passionate woman who talks to us about how she found her lump seven weeks after having a clean mammogram. Terrifying, right? Most recently, Fitz has a new book called My Noisy Cancer Comeback, where she reveals the juicy and gory details of her 16-month battle with breast cancer, all while zigzagging across the United States, managing her career, and thriving. She underwent chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. In today's episode, we talk about what it's like to lose your hair from chemotherapy, how it can be devastating when you're on stage announcing a race when you wake up and you see your hair all over your pillow. We also talk about to wear a wig or not to wear a wig. These are some real questions that we face. In her book, she answers so many questions about things I wish I had known when I was going through breast cancer. For example, that your nose hairs fall out, that you have all sorts of funny side effects that no one ever actually tells you about. We even get into the deep conversation about the pink ribbon. Now, being October, we are flooded with pink flamingos in people's yards, pink ribbons everywhere, pink balloons, etc. And for some, that can be incredibly empowering. For others, it's way too real and we're not doing enough. We must move beyond just awareness. It's all there in her book, My Noisy Cancer Comeback. So let's dive right in. Welcome to the show, Fitz. Fitz, it's so great to have you on the podcast today. So thank you so much. So thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm very excited to talk to our breast cancer community. You have quite a history as well. I love your athleticism and your engagement with sport exercise, fitness, all of this. I, prior to my own diagnosis, I was a pretty strict vegan. I worked out all the time, loved yoga, loved all of this great stuff. And when I was diagnosed at age 34, I was like, how can this happen to me? I'm doing all of the right things. And I feel like you're kind of coming into that space also, like as a as a celebrity in the fitness field and promoting health and wellness. Yeah, I mean, I've spent 30 years teaching people how to live better and longer and not only talking the talk, but walking the walk. I'm exhibit A of if it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. And that's not meant to scare people. It's meant to um, compel people to continue 
to look. Hopefully you never find anything, but I always like to start by saying it's your hands, it's your stuff. You stick your hands inside and you have a squeeze, squeeze your stuff. You know, it's when in every regard of your health, it's completely your responsibility. You choose what food goes in your mouth. You choose whether you move your body, you choose whether you sleep, you choose whether you investigate your body on a regular basis to find red flags. And um, yeah, yeah, I, I found it quickly. And you know, we, we, we slaughtered my breast cancer. Yes. I really have. <laughs> well, I love the empowerment that you're giving us. The, you know, just, we know our own bodies, we need to be proactive in taking care of our health. And yeah. that is more so than just getting annual mammograms, which I know we, we talk about, but you have this very interesting story where after getting a clear mammogram, seven weeks later, you discovered your own lump. Yeah. And I can tell you that uh, I, my whole life I've gone to annual skin checks and eye checks and pap smears and annual mammograms. And my, my thought process was, if I ever have one cancer cell in my body, I want to know about it and I want to kill it. And so clean mammogram in December of 2018. And then in February, I went like this less than seven weeks later. And I went, I was naked in a bathroom at Disney World in a, in a hotel, not just at Disney World, but um, it was like that, the under boob. And I thought, oh no. And it was there, it was a bean, you know, mm -hmm. I think of a black bean or kidney bean or whatever, but it shouldn't have been there. And I, um, I was not messing around. I knew what it was. I'm sure a lot of women can identify with that going, oh crap, I had breast cancer, but my cell phone in the bathroom with me, I picked it up within 30 seconds. I was on the phone with my gynecologist. I was taking it seriously. So were they. And, uh, you know, I, within 10 days, I had the diagnosis. 10 days later, I started chemo. So it was rapid fire. But thank God it was rapid fire because you don't want to find that information and then think, maybe I have a, maybe I have breast cancer. I got to call my mom and then I got to talk to my spouse and then I got to cry to my girlfriends and I got to Google it. That's crap. Y'all need to pick up the phone and call the doctor. If you find something abnormal like that, there is no time to wait. You have to move quickly. And um, I saved my own life by doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such a great message to share with people that, you know, don't be scared to pick up the phone and take action right away. So my other question is, you know, so you felt it right away because as we started this conversation, you've already been doing like self-breast exams. You're very aware of your body. So did you, did you, would you assume that if you haven't been doing that, would you have known that was breast cancer or were you just yes. so familiar with the texture and like, some of our breasts are lumpy and they feel, you know, there could be like scares, right? So you got right, really familiar right. with the normal. Yeah. So there are women who say they have very textured breast tissue. I'm not one of those people. Mine was definitely a hard bean. You know, I just can't describe it more than, you know, if you went and bought raw beans in a bag. It was, it didn't belong there. Yeah. It was trouble. It was trouble for sure. Yeah. Now, did you have a family history of breast cancer at all? None, none whatsoever. It's interesting because I too am a veggie and I eat really well. Like I said, I walk the walk, but um, I'm also, I pride myself on not being perfect. I don't diet. I don't do pills, powders. I just eat like a normal person, um, a thoughtful person with a caloric budget. And I, always have had a sweet tooth though. And I thought it was pretty compelling. I went in for a PET scan and they said the day before your PET scan, no, um, no sugar, no carbs, no caffeine. And then when I got there, they injected me with sugar water, some sort of fluid with sugar. And they said, because the sugar goes straight to cancer and makes it dance. And I thought, it's sugar, you know, and now mind you, I don't need it. I don't think everyone needs to be ragingly sugar free or, uh, uh but the fact that sugar goes straight to your cancer and makes it dance, that's disturbing. And of course, while I was going through chemo and bald and sick with a sore throat and everything hurt, I, they had all these candies, little hard candies out in the bowl. And then I went, I was still doing chemo at the time while I was um, doing radiation, having this stuff. And then I went back and I looked at those bowls of candy and I thought, what are they feeding us? Why are they giving us bowls of sugar? if this makes our cancer dance, I mean, come on. So, um, I'm not, um, you know, I have a cookie here and there, right. But I use Splenda for sweetener, right? Tons of produce. I've definitely have improved on what I used to be. And I ate like a lean athletic girl before. Now I eat like a girl who's fighting cancer. Yes. I foods that help versus foods that hurt. 
Exactly. And I hadn't, I actually started seeing a nutritionist because diet and nutrition is something that I've been struggling with since my diagnosis, seeing the full spectrum of being the strict vegan to, oh my God, like, honey, we're going out for steak. I can't believe I have cancer. <laughs> and I actually didn't go that far. He did. He went off the deep end. <laughs> but sure. Joe, just that you get so upset and enraged and you're looking for answers, but then how it becomes a catalyst to then, again, take it into your own hands of, okay, what am I putting into my body? This is my choice. And, you know, I can read labels, I can look at sugar, I can look at ingredients, I can see where my makeup is coming from, the things I rub on my face and on my skin every single day and how that goes directly into your bloodstream. You know, has this- Cell phone is always on speaker. Exactly. things, but I'm- I'm okay taking little extra efforts to save my own life, right? Exactly. So my nutritionist said to me, breast health is heart health. And that really resonated with me because I got really scared also having radiation on my left side, concerns for long-term side effects around cardiovascular health. And so I think you're absolutely right now that we're, when you're confronted with cancer, you're like world flashes in front of you, you're confronted with your own mortality. So the more that we can do and be conscious about it and make those decisions, I think the better, which is amazing. Well, how empowering and how fortunate for us that there are things we have within our control. And I remember when I was going through chemo and, um, you know, this would happen or that would happen. I'd ask my oncologist, say, uh, what can I do? And sometimes he would give me some guidance. And then at some point my, um, geez, Louise, I'm going to say HGB. That's wrong. That's wrong. I, my, I still have chemo brain, but basically my blood, red blood cells were going down or whatever. I kept saying, what can I do? Because I'm a girl, I'm proactive. I like to have power. I'm a, I'm a type A. He would say, there's nothing you can do about this. There's nothing you can do. And I ended up going in to get transfusions. And um, I, I didn't want transfusions. I didn't want stranger blood. I was totally grossed out. I'm a squeamish person. I thought, this is gross. Like, tell me what I can eat. And I'll do that instead of getting your stranger blood in the hospital. But um yeah. yeah, there is a lot of control and I love having that power. And so you needed the blood infusions because your red blood cell count was so low that they needed to yeah. give you that? Okay. Yeah. And it was, it was, I was in a bad place. I was in a very bad place. I had just announced the Buffalo Marathon weekend and um, I, my, those, those numbers were already going down before I left for that weekend, but um, I hosted, uh, I don't know, 15,000 people and one, two, three, four, five races that weekend. And I felt like hell and I knew there was something wrong, but I just thought, well, I always feel bad. So yeah. I guess this is, you know, I, I don't know how to fix it this time, but anyways, came home and yeah, I was admitted straight to the hospital. But even the nurses were like, honey, you look bad. You need to come on back <laughs> to find out what's wrong with you. <laughs> no, oh, feel man. Bad. Yeah. So I know we started off talking a little bit about your own diagnosis being diagnosed yes. with stage 2B that ended up. Um, going into some lymph node involvement as well. So it yeah. spread just beyond a little bit of like the internal ducts and glands yes. there. So what was your treatment plan after you found out? It sounded like within 10 days right away, this rapid fire, you're getting infusions. Yeah, they were concerned. Yeah, they were concerned. So I had a 14 millimeter lump and three lymph nodes that they knew about, and it was on the go moving quickly. So I had the um, the wonderful red a lot of people will identify with taxotere, carboplatin, progetta, and receptin, all drugs I sincerely loathe and love at the same time. And I did that for six rounds. And then I had one round of just progetta. And then they switched me to 14 rounds of Kudzyla after that. So it was every three weeks for 15 months. I had 33 rounds of radiation and, you know, three surgeries, poured in, poured out, and then the lumpectomy with lymph node removal. You know, what's funny is, you know how the triple negative girls have the red devil? So I, I had nicknames too. I'm a big nickname girl. My my book is full of nicknames for things, but um, we just called the, the mean four I had were the mean chemo. So those first rounds were just the mean chemo. And then I was assured Kudzyla would be fine, um, but it wasn't. So we called instead of, because the way it's spelled, it looks like Kudzilla. So we called it Godzilla. And uh, yeah, I mean, and, and then the radiation was zapped. So I was getting zapped and uh, yeah. And I had radiation cookies too. My, <laughs> they, they made homemade or not homemade, but they cooked up fresh Otis Funkmeyer cookies 
every day. So whenever I go to radiation, I have a cookie on the way. I was like a, like a kid or a dog. Good job. Here's your cookie, my radiation. The little things, it really helps, especially. And I think that's like another tidbit too that we can share that radiation is every day. It's a Monday through Friday showing up right. for that zap. And yeah. yeah, sometimes we don't think of the time commitment that it takes just to get treatment. You know, I, I correlate it to being hit by a truck. You know, it's one day you're fine. I mean, I found my lump at a race weekend. I was there to run a 10K. And then all of a sudden I had a band on in the hospital for my port that said, fall risk. And I thought, I'm an athlete. How the hell are they classifying me as a fall risk? But then after chemo, I actually almost like I was so dehydrated and dizzy and sick, I almost fell. And then I thought, where's my fall risk mandate? So yeah, I mean, your life just goes, boom. And then uh, you're stuck as if you had all your bones broken, you're stuck trying to get better. Um, yeah, it's overwhelming. And, and fortunately, if there's some girls out there just diagnosed, it's not like this for everybody. Some people just have a lumpectomy. Some people just have radiation. And, and you know, it sounds exactly. like you and I went through some severe stuff and a lot of people even go through worse, but um, not not everybody reacts so, so negatively. And yeah. and I, I as, as I'll talk about, I had some good times through the process. So. Yeah, well, absolutely. So I want to mention the book that you wrote, My Noisy Cancer Comeback, which is running at the mouth while running for my life. Love it. Nice. Yeah, I'm so, so proud. It just awesome. came in my first copies and it even, it even feels good. I'm so happy. I'm like, I'm oh, sleep with it. But awesome. Yeah, I'm like, cancer comeback. <laughs> and you have it as like hardcover, digital, um, all sorts of formats. Yeah, hardcover, paperback, digital, and audiobook. Fantastic. And I'll link to all of those in the show notes below so all of our Thank listeners you. can get it. access to it. But as I was going through, you have such like interesting titles also for your book and kind of your oh, chapter titles. Yes, chapter titles and your spunk and energy going into this hellhole, for lack of a better description of cancer mm-hmm. and how you almost can like laugh about it. You talk about the the realities but also it's a little bit of a roadmap. I love how you write in almost like a diary form day by day of exactly what's happening and the timeline of your diagnosis and all the processes that you're going through because you're living it. And it's, I think, really helpful for someone to know like three days ago, I think it was your third chemo treatment, you were on a plane going to announce another race. The Los Angeles Marathon, yeah. So yeah. So uh, if you go to a publishing expert, they'll say, do not write anything in like diary format, date and chronological order. But the reality is with cancer, people want to know dates. They go, okay, when did you have your clean mammogram? When were you diagnosed? When did you start this? When did you do start that? So I thought those dates were really important, the timeline. And then as well, I had these profound experiences with 22 major race weekends on the calendar. And while I didn't tell everything, all the details, because that would have been a 900 page book, um, I was able to include, you know, what happens when you have chemo on Monday and then on Friday you have to get on a plane to go to Los Angeles to host 30,000 people. And, you know, I went from, I had long, luxurious, be- in my opinion, it was beautiful long blonde hair. I, I've always been a long hair girl. Oh, and then when I was at that long, so Los Angeles Marathon was the first race I announced post chemo. And mm-hmm. I had been public. I told people, hey, listen, this is what I'm going through. I would have kept it private, but I was going to have to stand on stages bald. And I knew people were going to ask questions, right? So I said, blah, blah, blah. This is what's going on. I'll be fine. I want no pity. You can pray for me. You can root for me. No pity, no sadness, no sad faces. So um, I show up to Los Angeles and the hair is starting to fall out. It's just starting to fall out. And I thought, okay, I won't brush it. I'll just kind of finger brush it and it'll, it'll be fine. And so I got through um, Friday and Saturday like that, but then on Saturday night, my hair was kind of nasty. It was, I don't know, 40 hours without brushing long hair like that. You have to do something. So I started brushing and maybe hundreds of hair was coming out and I was alone in my hotel bathroom. And, um, you know, I don't know if it would have helped to be home with my family, but I can tell you it was 
traumatizing to be there alone. And I just sobbed. And then I'm so Irish. You know, when I cry, I get the poofy eyes and the red nose and I'm hideous when I cry. So I was trying to <laughs> keep it in. And I went to sleep and woke up at uh, 4 a.m. on Sunday morning. And again, the hair was just oh. everywhere. So I was in the bathroom and I decided for some reason to shoot a video. I was like, I'm just going to document this. And um, it, I just released it on social media at Fitness. But, um, and I was trying to tell people what it was like and choking back the tears. But anyways, I got, got dressed like a big girl, went to the finish line. And, um, you know, the good news is being surrounded by 25,000 runners is really wonderful. Really, you know, it was um, super hard, but also being around them was very healing. Anyways, we, it was windy. I was on a tall tower, my stage, and I have an announcing partner, Rudy. And as we looked down, my the whole black stage was covered with long blonde hair. And um, thank God for sunglasses because all day I, it was schizophrenic. I was like, and here comes Susie Q from Montreal. And the second I get off the microphone, it was just sobbing. You know, it was it was agonizing. I woke up the next morning and um, got on my plane back to Florida, and I had texted my hairstylist in the morning. I said, can you come to my house tonight? And she knew what it was about. She said, no problem. But I sat in my chair. I got up to use the bathroom. There might have been 500 hairs on my chair and on the floor of the plane. It was awful. And I was apologizing to the lady next to me. And she was very compassionate. I was like, I'm so sorry, I chemo, and I just can't keep it in. But um, but yeah, so we shaved it last that night. And it was, you know, brutal. And everybody, yeah. you know that, I'm sure. Yeah. It's, it's brutal. But now I have hair again. <laughs> yeah, super cute. It does come back. I do remind people. So you had really long blonde hair to start. Did you trim it before you decided to shave it or did you keep you it know, long? It didn't even cross my mind. It's funny. I have a girlfriend right now. She's beautiful, Natalia. She's going through colon cancer treatment and she had long, beautiful brown hair. She cut it short and it's thinned out, but it's still there. I can't even think of just going for something short. I just knew it was I just couldn't handle the chaos that was involved with it falling right. out anymore. So, right. but it was funny. My stylist, she goes, so what, um, what number do you want me to shave it to? And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> just shave it. So she shaved it to a number two and then I had to go in again. I went in two more times to have it shaped again. And then I was a total cue ball and I never yeah. wore a wig. I just, I just decided to be bald girl. No, I'm with you there. I, so I got my hair cut down to like the little pixie style okay. because I figured if I'm ever going to cut it short, now's the time. Mm -hmm. If I'm ever going to go bald, now's the time. Right. Yeah. Um, but after the pixie uh, cut, you know, it, I do remember the hair falling out and I was suffering such bad hot flashes with the chemotherapy. Yeah. So I felt like a cat, like the hair was just falling. And I, so I got frustrated. I was like, I was not sad. I was like, we are going to a barbershop like right now and getting it shaved. Like I am just wow. done. Um, and of course, like I walk into this like barbershop and he like shows me a sketchbook. Like if I want something etched into my head and I'm like, <laughs> no, no, just yeah. take it all, take it all. And he's like, are you sure? I'm like, I have cancer. I'm sure. Like, <laughs> gonna go. you know, well, you know, I used to be worried that I'd have a splotch like Gorbachev. Remember the Russian, Russian prime minister. Anyway, I didn't have a birthmark, but what I had was a six inch tan line from my part. It was about half an inch long and I went here and it was just a tan line and it stayed there the whole time. That's it never hilarious. went away. It was oh so weird. Oh, but you know, I it's, know. it's it's in the past. So it's yeah. okay now. And the wig conversation I want to linger on a little bit too. So I loved your story a little bit about how you did go to a wig shop. You wanted to yeah. try on different wigs because we don't know. We want to be prepared. We want to feel like we have control. And yeah. you referenced not only were they uncomfortable, which I think we all know, but you didn't mm -hmm. feel like yourself, right? It made you feel sad. And I thought that was such a touching moment of how to describe the experience of putting on the wig. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I had gone, I thought it would be fun to do with my kids. I mean, obviously this, there's not a lot of fun going on, but I was trying to make the best of it. I have two teenagers that were 14, 16 at the same time, same time, and they were interested in wigs. And I didn't know, I was like, okay, I'll give wigs a go. And, um, you know, one store caters to older women and has a bunch of like short, sassy cuts, which just kind of weren't me. And they could have ordered something, but I didn't really want to order something. I want to try something on. And then the other store caters to minority women um, because they have a hell of a lot more fun with their hair and they do lots of cool stuff and they just didn't have much for me. And the uh, woman 
who was helping me. I went and I said, so I have breast cancer and I'm start chemo. And she's like, oh, honey, I really don't have much for you, but I'll look and see what I do have. <laughs> One of them was like a Shirley Temple cut. Oh, it was horrible. And I put it on and they were all having a good laugh. And I was just dying inside and I couldn't, I'm, I'm so smiley as you can see. Yeah, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a joy addict. I couldn't even fake the smile. I just kept trying and, you know, wig after wig, I maybe got four on and they all just crushed my soul. And I thought, I can't wear these. I can't, and they don't feel good. And I'm in Florida for crying out loud. It's 95,000 degrees most of the year. Um, And they just didn't feel like me. And so I decided I can't wear them. And you know what? Men don't hide their heads. So this is what it's going to be for me. I'm, I'm going to be bald and obviously I'm not going to look the way I choose to look, but I'm choosing to fight for my life and the baldness is a consequence. And I don't think, even though I thought I had fabulous hair, I don't think anyone in the world ever chose me because of my hair. I think they chose me because I'm really kind and um, kind of fun to be around and I work hard and I take good care of people. So, you know, there wasn't actual value on my hair to anyone but myself. So I was definitely sad. I definitely sobbed many, many hours because of my hair, but, um, but then I held my head high and I, you know, I had to stand on stages bald and, you know, fortunately for me, I have an on switch. So the only thing, any of the people in my audience, my runners, my, you know, guests, if I was doing a keynote, the only thing they saw was pure confidence and cockiness. And even if I wasn't feeling that way, and it was, some of it was very manufactured and, fake but I have the ability to perform and I did and um what I really hope is that um those in my audience that will one day have cancer and with the magnitude of people I speak to I know many of them will have cancer I hope they too have the confidence to choose to just do what works for them whether it's lots of different fun wigs or great hats or scarves or no nothing at all i just want people to have confidence to be themselves and do what feels good for them yeah absolutely i i felt the same way i didn't feel like myself i think i wore the wig maybe one time to a restaurant and i was so self-conscious i could not enjoy like the date night i could not i thought everyone looked at me they they knew um, but I did wear my wig on Halloween that I think was the only time I felt comfortable because everyone was dressed up and just like walking the streets of Boston and just like, you know what? Like, no, no one looks normal right now. So right. I will wear my wig and, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, it's funny. We did buy one. It's a long brown kind of cinnamony color. And my kids love Marvel and DC Comics. And there's a superhero called Jean Grey. And it was, they called it the Jean Grey wig. And you know what? It was 40 bucks. And I was like, yep, let's take it. I knew I was never going to wear it when I bought it, but it made the kids happy. And I was like, so it will be used for someone's Halloween costume one day. It's oh, great. Absolutely. And I have to commend you also, whether it was by choice or by will, that you worked all the way through all of your treatments. One burning question I have is your doctors let you get on planes while going through chemo? Man, I have the best doctors in the world. Yeah, so I travel for a living and I I actually do zero work here in Gainesville, Florida. Um, They all required plane trips. And what my doctors knew was that my career was important to me. It was my passion and that I needed it to do my best. I needed joy and the things that made me happy. So they wanted me to keep living. So after my first chemo, it took about four days for my stomach to explode, for stuff to hit the fan. A horrible first weekend. And and this is an ignorant thing. My doctor gave me his email and his phone number, cell phone number. It's a call whenever you need me. So I get so sick, dizzy, the whole thing. I don't call him because I think, well, I have cancer. I have chemo. I'm supposed to be sick. I could have reached. I could have called for that lifeline, but I just thought it would have been preposterous for me to do that. So finally, Monday morning at about 2 a.m., I'm in the bath. I'm like, Bleh. so I, I send him an email in the middle of that. I wake up to a, a text from him that says, oh, my God, come in right away. And so I go in and he says, listen, we're going to give you IV fluids. I say, I have to get on the plane to Los Angeles on Friday. He said, we need to get you on your feet then. And so instead of telling me stay home and hide out and take shelter, he said, we are going to keep you going. And it was the greatest gift to me. I mean, A, I think he felt I was a little stubborn and I wasn't staying home, whether he wanted me to or not. (laughs) But he really worked in my favor. Uh, I feel very fortunate. I have a career that I'm so passionate about. 
Uh, it was hard. It was hard trudging through airports with the likes of a tequila hangover, if you know what I mean. I mean, I was, uh, I'm thankfully a member of the Delta Sky Lounge and they have lovely bathrooms, um, but it was difficult managing all of that um, on the go. And my race directors, gosh, a few of them I called in advance. I said, listen, I'm gonna be there and I'm gonna perform as expected, but I need a little help. Can you arrange for me to have IV fluids in your hometown? And quite a few of them did. So there was times where I got straight off a plane and someone picked me up in the car and brought me to one of those weird hydration salons, which is crazy that people go do this for um, just because they want to. I had uh, IV fluids in my hotel room at the Buffalo Marathon. I had the medical director in Kansas City. You know, I had a bunch of medical directors ready to just hook me up on my stage as I worked. It would have been like, you know, IV over here, microphone in this hand, but. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was chaos. And that's actually, you know, talking about the book, I wrote it because at first I thought, oh my gosh, all this weird stuff is happening. Nobody tells you this. They tell you you get sick and you're bald and you feel bad. Nobody tells you all the little minute details. And there were, there were an avalanche of side effects and they were some, they were, they were hard to deal with. But then I thought, this is kind of funny. I mean, can you believe what's going on? My husband and I would look at each other and say, this is the twilight zone. I have to tell people. And again, I didn't tell anybody while I was going through it, but I started taking notes about the weird stuff. And then when cancer care collided with my career and I was dealing with all of these side effects while hosting 25,000 people, or I host the DC Wonder Woman run series. So I literally would spend some nights face down on the bathroom hotel floor and then I would get up and I would put on my Wonder Woman tutu and go stand with Wonder Woman toes. I mean, it was just crazy. So, um, you know, I could I could have called the book Adventures in Breast Cancer, which I don't know if that's insulting to breast cancer because the, it really sucks, right? But um, the experience for me was very unique. However, it also would qualify in so many regards as the same experience you went through and Susie and Nancy and, and Tamika, you know, we all have these things in common. And, um, and I, I think it's kind of funny. I, I really, yeah. you know, there's some hard, real raw, you know, tear jerker moments in the book, but there's also a bunch of things that I, I think the, the breast cancer patients and survivors are going to have a big laugh and, you know, send me a little virtual. Oh, hug. they absolutely will. Um, are you able to share any like sneak peek about what some of these crazy side effects are that you're, you're referencing? Well, yeah. So one of my favorite things was right after chemo started, um, you, you know, they tell you in the chair, you're going to, you may have an allergic reaction, but I wake up the next day. I've got my whole face is covered with a rash, right? I've got little things going wrong. Just my throat hurts, all of this stuff. And two weeks after chemo, I think it was the third week out. I'm hosting another race in California. It's the week after LA Marathon. So I came home and I went back, but I'm on the stage and my nose had been running and running and running. And I had all of these tissues on the stage. And I have a friend, Dana, she had conquered breast cancer the year prior and ran the race. So that's how we became friends because I was making a royal stink out of her. So she knows about my diagnosis. She crosses the finish line. I'm on the microphone. I said, hey, Dana, come on over. Um, to see me and I want to, I, I bring her to my stage. I just want to get a hug and say hi. And she goes, how are you doing? And mind you, I wasn't doing well, but I didn't want to say that and ruin her day. And I was like, I'm fine. My allergies are acting up. And she looks at like the 150 tissues on my stage. She goes, you don't have allergies. They go, yeah, I do. She goes, you don't have any nostril hair. I was like, what? She goes, you don't have any nostril hair. And she was right. It was the craziest thing. And my nose didn't just run like I had a cold. Anytime I looked down, it was splish, splash, massive raindrop style. Nobody tells you that, right? A hundred percent. I was just as shocked about not having the nose hair and the eyelashes. That mm. that was a piece where I was like, okay, we know about we're going to lose the hair on our heads. But that translates to we lose all of the hair on our bodies. Uh -huh. So the eyelashes for me were that was a that was a tough moment for me because I was like babies are born and they have eyelashes. Like, you know, that that was like even they have them. Like walking outside, like the dust particles and like just everything got into my oh, eyes. The tearing, the tearing. Yes. 
so when I lost my eyelashes, so I was getting lash extensions. So before breast cancer, I had lash extensions. And again, I'm always on a stage. So I wanted to have a little extra yeah. something. So um, when they fell out, they all fell out on my right eye. And then my left eye still had about 20. And they were super long from the extensions. So, you know, baby face from Toy Story, the little toy. It's the dog oh, yeah. head mm-hmm. with a missing eye. And then has the big blue eye with the lashes and the robot legs. That was me. That I was baby face. So, you know, I went from Shrek with the ogre bumps all over my head to baby face. And then when they went, I thought I was like, I am Voldemort. So, um, um, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. There's definitely a lot of side effects that they don't prepare us for. They don't tell us about. And, you know, so it's so great to have this roadmap in your book to really share with us, like what I wish we had known type of thing. So the other thing is when I had Godzilla or Godzilla, I started that and they had said, oh, this will be so much less toxic than taxiteer. You're going to be great. So I get it. And uh, the next day I wake up, run to the bathroom, like heaving, blah, blah, nothing's coming out, but I'm just heaving. And so that became my thing. I'd be walking the dog, (laughs) nothing was coming out. I just did spontaneous heaving 10 times a day while I was driving, while I was doing laundry. It was, nobody tells you that. Right. I sounded like a goat. I became goat girl. Ah, ah, so <laughs> you have like nicknames for the drugs, the radiation everything. for yeah, everything. The, oh, yeah. I love it. That's right. It's all right here. Exactly. Um, yeah. So May 11th this year, I finished now, um, you know, on the flip side, I'm a fitness expert going through it. So I can backtrack to tell you that I was uh, ignorant. I thought ah, after my first chemo, I'll take a few days off and then I'll start working out again. Well, didn't go so well. And then during the main chemo, I was really just wiped out from exercise altogether. And I didn't even feel bad about it. I just knew that if I tried to move, it was going to be harmful. Um, But then through Godzilla, I was able to start baby steps, doing light, gentle stretches in the pool, little water walking and, and so forth. And towards the end, I started really doing much better and better. So I finished chemo May 11th, um, Godzilla. And then on June 13th, Oh, no. On June 3rd, I got my port out. June 13th, I did a Spartan obstacle course race. And then two weeks later, I did a mini triathlon. Now, mind you, I got my tail kicked. I was the dead last finisher. I finished behind obese people. I finished behind really elderly people. I finished behind little kids. I was the dead last finisher, and I hyperventilated almost half the distance. Cop behind me, like trailing me to keep me safe, right? But I did it, you know? So... You know, once I finished, so once I finished treatment, I was ready to grab life again. I just wanted to do stuff, even if it was hard. And so the triathlon specifically was crazy hard, but I thought, you know what, last year I was dealing with real hard, you know, that lying in bed sick all day. That was legit hard. This kind of hard I can do. So, um, yeah, I've come full circle. I'm feeling really healthy and very happy. That's amazing. I'm so glad to hear. I feel like we could talk for hours. Like, honestly, you talk about the relationship with, you know, your doctors and how important that is for people to build relationships with their doctors. I've had a lot of conversations with women who no, don't necessarily have that rapport and how critical that is for that doctor to to know what drives you and what to keeps you going. So that way you keep, yeah. one, keep showing up for treatment, which can also be a concern that people don't always want to go back. I know I suffer from doctor fatigue, appointment fatigue, yes. testing fatigue, but to really find that partnership in your medical care team, I think that's really important. And I'm glad to hear your examples and experience with that. Cause I think that just tells our listeners even more like these people are out there. And if you aren't happy with your relationship with your doctor and, uh, you know, get second or third or fourth opinions until you find that fit and someone who sees your values too. Like, yes, the doctors are the experts are the medical experts and they can give us that advice, but we're the experts of our own body and our life. And so, you know, to find that partnership is really what's going to make us succeed and live. Yeah. And here, this is what some people don't recognize is that doctors come to you with suggestions. They're service providers. So they can tell you, this is, you know, this is your situation. This is the proper, this is a protocol. This is what I believe we should do. But as a consumer slash patient, whatever you want to call yourself, you decide, but yeah, that sounds good to me. Or that doesn't sound like something I want to be involved in. And and you can say, no, thank you. Um, You know, I decided that I trust my physician so much that I wanted everything. You know, if they said this particular, if you get the radiation boost, it'll increase your chances of, 
of not having a recurrence by 3%. I was like, okay, give me, I'll take every percent I can get never to have to do this again. Um, but yeah, but I was in charge of me and I'm always in charge of me. So um, I, I hope the other women take that same mindset. You are in control of you, not your spouse, not your kids, not your parents. You are in charge of you. So, you know, evaluate those suggestions from your doctors. And if you have a doctor you don't think is listening to you or cares properly, there are other doctors. Yes, exactly. It's so empowering. You talk in one of your chapters about pink, the pink ribbon, the pink bows, and specifically yeah. at a time where how it almost you weren't ready for it and that it made it too much of a reality. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. I've worn a million pink ribbons before my diagnosis and I've worked I've, as a, just a friend I've gone out, I've supported breast cancer causes and I've trained some patients going through breast cancer. And, you know, I never, never thought twice about doing it. And then the second I was diagnosed, I became completely averse to pink ribbons and, I thought, oh, this is horrible because pink ribbon is the symbol of finding the cure and awareness. And there's so much good tied into it, but it made me feel bad. And I decided I don't want anything to do with it. Mind you, everybody was sending me stuff with pink ribbons all over it. And fortunately, I have a, a teenage daughter who's my same exact side. So I'd say, Ginger, you look beautiful in this pink ribbon sweatshirt or whatever. Um, and then I also felt guilty because it means so much to other people. And obviously I've benefited from that research and that awareness. So um, it finally did hit me when October rolled around and it made me feel like a victim. You know, I'm someone who, uh, I, I'm all about strength and happiness and resilience. And this was my weakness, right? This was the thing, if I wore a pink ribbon, it would make me feel like my weakness was on display <laughs> even though the bald head, right? Um, but yeah, it just the pink ribbons make me still do. They make me feel like a victim. And um, I have chosen not to wear them. Now, mind you, I wear pink. My book cover is pink. I, you know, I go and I support Komen and ACS and AACR. And I, I work with a lot of great causes. But this is just something that, you know, makes me feel good. And much like the wigs, you have to do what works for you. And I'm still at the point where pink ribbons still make me feel bad. So I don't, I don't wear them. And yeah. I think that's okay. I think my actions speak louder than my, you know, my wardrobe. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a funny thing, right? And it, yeah. there are, I don't think there's any wrong decisions when it's your cancer. Oh, exactly. Like you see people with the ribbons and the boas and the big sunglasses and they're crushing it I, and I'm happy. All about and, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but especially speaking of like October as well, it can be incredibly triggering. And I think that is something too that I like to acknowledge when speaking with other women diagnosed with breast cancer, that, you know, it can be reliving a very traumatic part in our, in our life and bring up emotions that we might not have been ready for. I remember, and mind you, I'm still on hormonal therapy, so my emotions are all over the place. Right. But, you know, driving to work and then like a big bus comes by with these beautiful women talking about a cure and I like lost it. I am like, I don't know how that one one day for that discount at that store is going to like find that cure because what about the other 364 days? So, you well, know, I, yeah. It all adds up. It all adds up, but I'm with you. In fact, that's why my October chapter is called The Thing with Pink Ribbons. And so I explain my philosophy or my experience with it, but it was haunting because and that's when I was doing chemo and radiation every day. And every day I pulled into that um, medical facility and they have, I don't know, a thousand little pink flamingos stuck in the ground to honor Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is great, right? But I yes. also thought... I am never going to escape this disease. I'm, you know, I'm always going to be squeezing, looking over my shoulder, but then I'm always going to be reminded. And, you know, as you know, it's a brutal time in my life. So, um, you know, I'm trying to make lemonade and it just is part of my history. Hopefully, hopefully just part of my past. Now I actually, I just had a follow-up mammogram and ultrasound today and they were clean. Thank goodness. Woo! But Yeah. Yeah. But I woke up and I didn't, realize I was nervous, but I, I woke up and I had the stomach ache and I had the heart palpitations and I didn't 
think I'd be nervous, but I woke up thinking, oh God, today my life could take a totally different turn again. So, Oh, I know. My heart you know, sinks I, every time like a colleague is like, oh, I'll be in a little bit late today. I just have my mammogram. I'm like, oh, like, I, I don't, it's very different yeah, these days. It's very real. Yeah, for sure. You also bring up another topic that I love talking about at survivebreastcancer.org or on our podcast is this idea of life after cancer. And I would love to get your opinion on, I know you're, you mentioned that you're doing really well and you're yeah. working and thriving, but is it something that you still think about every day? And then as a mom with a daughter, is it something like, how do you address that with your children? Um, so I'm not extra worried about my kids because they don't have any pr- genetic predisposition predisposition. So I feel like Ginger and Parker both are, you know, she's the one in eight, uh, you know, as far as my son, he'll be far less than one in eight. Um, so I don't feel like this will be an albatross for her. Although hopefully she will be wise and squeeze her stuff. And I will be the harassing mommy telling her to, you know, just kind of thinking about life after cancer. It is something that, you know, for me, I, I do think about it every day. It's also part of my job and my work and what I I do. I hear stories, I share stories, I provide support. But today, you know, being four years out from my own diagnosis, I actually chose not to post on social media today, like everyone sharing their cancerversaries, because I'll, I'll probably post tomorrow about the fact that it's just another day and you move past it. It's, it's significant to me. And for me, it's it, it's part of my identity. I want to embrace it because it's so much of the catalyst of what my career has changed and shifted. And and I, I welcome that. But I also meet women who you know do pack it up in a package and put it on the shelf. And they don't want to talk about it and keep their stories very close to their vest. And that's okay, too. So I just was curious to know how you're doing and you know, mentally and how's your heart doing in terms of like emotionally going through all of this? So I feel for the most part, I feel really good. I feel um, very grateful to be alive. I was grateful to be alive before. And now I have an even greater zest for each day. Um, you know, clearly I've, 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 I've had a silver lining with the book, but this is also who I am. I've spent 30 years helping people live better and longer. So I'm not abandoning the breast cancer thing. However, what I've decided is a few things. Um, Number one, I didn't earn breast cancer. So it doesn't belong in maybe the first three lines of my bio. You know, I earned my master's degree. I earned the privilege of being spokesperson for, you know, Tropicana and Oakley and those things. Those those are things I earned. Um, The race announcing, I earned that. Breast cancer is something um, also very distinct about my experience and so, so breast cancer belongs in there because it's valid. And I've used the past year and a half on those race stages and beyond teaching people, you know, compelling them to squeeze their stuff and take their health very seriously. So this breast cancer will be one of my bag in my bag of tricks on the way I help people live better, longer. And so again, whether they're squeezing their chest, their testicles, getting their eye exams, you know, I, I want people to continue to, um, use early detection as a way to save their life. And hopefully those methods we talked about earlier, which is, you know, prevention. Can you eat a little better? Can you exercise more? Can you get more sleep? Can you clean out your environment a little bit? So um, I don't feel like a victim anymore. <laughs> no, well, I never felt like a victim, but I just don't, I don't feel like I have it. And I, uh, 93% curable, and that's not enough with a disease that has one in eight women, um, diagnosed. However, you know, the type of breast cancer I had, what I'm told is it's really not likely to come back. So I'll check, 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 but I don't wake up with a stomach ache over it anymore. You know, I feel like I'm done and hopefully. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm really done. I don't want to have to do it again. I love I that. Feel good. And I think that's a great test too. I'm going to definitely bring that up of like the three sentence bio test. Like, is it in your bio? I think that's a great barometer to kind of see where we are on that spectrum. And eventually you will get to a point where when your friends ask you how you are, but you really know they're going to know how treatment's going, is actually going to be, no, how am I? This is what I did with my family today. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm still just so close to being out of treatment where people say, so how are you? And I say, well, I'm healthy, I'm cancer-free. You know, that's still part of my answer now because I know they really care and want to know. But hopefully next year I'm just back to being 
you know, annoying, noisy, bossy fits. Nobody has to worry about me. They have full faith. I'm doing fine. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Um, like to get your book, all of, and of course I'll put all of this in the show notes below and link to it um, in our write-up and our blogs and everything, but how can people reach you? Thank you. So fitness.com, F-I-T-Z-N-E-S-S is the number one way to reach me. You can reach out if you have questions, you just want to chat. There's a contact fits form if you need a speaker for your event. Um, and then of course my books are on sale there from Woo! the top right corner. It's fitness store. So here's the deal. Can I, I can be frank, right? Oh, absolutely. So it will be on sale on Amazon and Kobo and all those things. Amazon takes 55%, 55%. So I will have the books available at my store and every copy sold at fitness.com will be autographed. And then I have a really fun gift with purchase we're creating right now. So um, everyone will get a little bonus if they come to fitness.com. But I, I truly appreciate the support and um, my beta readers, the people that have read it in advance, um, breast cancer and other types of cancer have said, golly, I wish I had that. I wish I had it when I was first diagnosed or my family had it because it would have helped us a lot. So I'm hoping it does help a lot. Yeah, I think that's a good point too about the family because by the time you're going through chemo and all the appointments with your doctors, you don't have time to regurgitate it all to your family and friends. So to be like, here, just read this book, get caught up, ask me questions later. <laughs> Well, so here's the other thing. I, I have a few rants in there, these little sidebars spaced throughout the book. You may have noticed them. But, um, you know, when I was diagnosed, people would come and they go, oh, you have breast cancer? My mom died of breast cancer. And I just, I was like, why would you say that to me? Why? I didn't say that. But, oh, really? My sister died of breast cancer. Thank you. Like, why? So there's a few rants in the book, something similar to, oh, well, it's just hair. Mm. All right. Well, nobody wants to lose their hair this way. It's very traumatic. And that's very similar to saying, oh, your dog died. It's just a pet. No, I, we love our dog. We, we value our hair. So yeah. there's a few rants in there that I wish the whole world would read and um, make our life, you know, it would have made my life a lot easier when all the amount of people are like, oh, someone so died. And I was like, what? Yeah, just be not positive. what I need to hear. Yeah. No, be positive. <laughs> Don't exactly. Tell me your horror story. Thank you very much. So, right. Exactly. Um, yeah. Hopefully, it's a useful, useful tool too. Enjoyable and useful. Oh. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule and traveling and everything that you have going on in your world to be on our podcast to share your story with us for us to have a deep dive discussion on not only your diagnosis but your book launch, which is super exciting. Thank you, Laura. Just in time for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. This has been a pleasure and good luck to everyone out there. I wish you all the best. Thank you for tuning in and listening to our podcast. If you would like to find out more about our organization and upcoming events and ways to connect, you can find out more by visiting our website at survivingbreastcancer.org. I would like to acknowledge that all of the information on our podcast is from personal experiences and it is not a substitute for professional medical advice. You should always consult your medical care team. If you're looking for specific topics or would like to be a guest on our show, feel free to contact me directly at laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. And of course, we have a couple social media handles you can follow us at as well. For example, Surviving Breast Cancer Org, all one word, as well as our podcast specifically, Breast Cancer Conversations. Until next time, keep on thriving.